So it turns out that um, autistic women are shockingly not being studied as much as they could be, but more and more research is emerging around the female phenotype. And I wanted to share, I'm sharing all recent articles from 2024 and 2023 on narratives through the lens of autistic women who were late diagnosed. If you're new here, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and my whole vibe right now, and has been for a long time, autism, trauma, and I'll be adding more ADHD in, especially through the lens of the female perspective, but not solely, uh, more high masking, but also just looking at this population that would be called the female phenotype, but anyone can relate to these symptoms and be autistic, have ADHD, and of course, trauma. So let's get into this one. This is a uh, review of 50 women. They did a, looked at from nine qualitative studies looking at four, I think it's four themes, again, I just made a video about menopause and autism, about what the experiences were like for autistic women who were late diagnosed. And the core of this, I'm gonna go through this research article, I'll link it down below, is this, that in childhood, autistic women who participated in, this, in these studies remembered feeling like they were weird, or I've used the word aliens, and being often bullied due to their inability and struggles with socializing or having negative social interactions again and again and again. Number two, they imitated their more easygoing peers often in social situations, the idea of masking, mimicking, imitating, to keep up appearances, often with the desire to present an image of like, I've got this, I'm in control. Next, after their diagnosis, these women felt like they were more able to be themselves more often than not, rather than trying to be this ideal person they had spent their often life trying to be. The women who participated in the studies um, said if they had been diagnosed in childhood, they would have coped a lot better with more dangerous situations over the course of their lives. And that they had, um, in many regards, in the studies, they felt proud of their autistic identity and success once they looked at and understood like really how many challenges they had faced. Now the framework of the study was done through the lens of neurodiversity and intersectionality. And it's important to understand that because we're talking about the medical models of disability, how we see people's roles, how we understand differences. And as a result of that, kind of that's the lens through which we're gonna interpret the data from the study. So there was a four, there were four subordinate themes that were identified. The first one was wanting to fit in. And like I said earlier, many discussed feeling like odd or persecuted, um, a feeling weird or alien in their social dynamics and having a difficult time in friendship interactions. And that sort of the idea of culture setting the standard for, you know, we make eye contact here, we smile here, we raise our voice or don't raise our voice. Certainly the expectations of women taking certain subordinate roles and being pleasant and all of those things and not too direct. And then I would add, you know, growing up like in the South or places like that, there are these, all these layers, we're talking about intersectionality, that affect what we're supposed to do or not do and how we're gonna deal with that. It talks about the idea that within the uh, making a good sort of fit in first impression, that the women with autism and girls are often like always trying, continuously trying to make um, good impressions, to manage their social interactions and what burnout that creates when you're just sort of on it all of the time. And that's a big reason why a lot of other articles and I've talked about um, our nervous systems being overwhelmed. This is true with trauma and neurodivergence that it's like that fight or flight needs to rest and that social interactions, especially in autism are gonna be, even if you love to socialize, exhausting and often require a lot of recovery time. It says difficulties with social interaction and misunderstandings frequently occur between autistic and non-autistic individuals, described as the double empathy problem. Many of you have heard of this. This theory challenges the idea that autistic individuals lack empathy for others and proposes that autistic and non-autistic people can misunderstand the feelings and behaviors of the other. After all, social communication is a two-sided affair. And so it says, growing evidence demonstrates that non-autistic people often find understanding autistic people really difficult and have a hard time inferring their emotional states and can really judge them negatively based on first impressions. 
And it talked about many of these women who were, once again, often unaware they were autistic in childhood and how that knowledge and not understanding all that they were doing was so depleting and filled with overwhelm and shame and difficulty. And so the idea is, of course, especially in you know child-centric circles, we want in human circles, um, the animals that fit in that are and accepted are gonna have a different experience. The humans are the same way. And so it talks about like I mentioned earlier, that the factors that affect us being accepted are often you know, bigger than we are in terms of like society and culture and expectation and things like that. The second theme focused on making sense of past experiences. So once people were diagnosed, they were trying to kind of like look through the lens of, oh, that's why I struggled here or struggled there. Also interesting, it talks about the fact that, of course, many of them were wishing they had been diagnosed earlier to prepare and be more aware of you know, victimization and danger. But that often women, these women are pushing for their own diagnoses later in life, as opposed to a child being identified. And by the way, late diagnosis, I didn't realize this, is anyone after the age of 13, which is just crazy when you look at how many women are being diagnosed, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond. The next part of the narrative of understanding their autism was this idea of developing a new autistic identity and how the, you know, in some ways with growing social media and like all the things we talk about and access to online communities, that there is more possibility now for those who are neurodivergent to make connections. But I still feel like if you talk to most of us, we keep thinking like, wouldn't it be great if we could all, you know, have this network together because there is something about communication and, and understanding the autism piece, especially I think with people who, who kind of like get it. So the bottom line was that obviously creating a more positive autistic identity helps increase your kind of personal and collective self-esteem and gives you another kind of tool for managing your well-being and, and understanding who you are and how you want to engage in the world. And once again, this goes back to the last one, is the barriers to support. I was talking about menopause and autism and that the barriers are significant. When so many GPs and psychiatrists and clinicians have really only one lens of autism that is very DSM focused, the old DSM even more so. And even an example here, one person says, when I mentioned the possibility to my psychiatric nurse of being autistic, she actually laughed at me. I asked my mom, this is all in the UK, who was a GP at the time, if she thought I was autistic. And she said, of course not. And so the idea is that more GPs and, and clinicians are used to identifying autistic features in boys, first of all. And they may not, they may not even think of autism when they come in, um, when patients come in with these histories of you know, anxiety and depression and medications and things like that that haven't worked. It says this could be either a reflection of gender bias by clinicians or the fact that females are more, are more motivated and successful at emulating non-autistic behavior. So not only do they not understand it, but we're better at masking and sort of not even being able to differentiate at times what the mask is from who we are. Another possibility of the gender disparity could be that clinicians have been under the impression that women could not be autistic due to misinterpreting a theory about extreme male brains, going back to Asperger. And the bottom line is that was a theory that Hans Asperger suggested in 1944, who stated that the autistic personality is an extreme variant of male intelligence. That's the bottom line, which we know that that's not necessarily accurate, and there's been lots of criticism, heavy, heavy criticism about that theory. It says this theory relies on a binary model of brains, which suggests that differences in social skills between males and females are biologically determined but fails to account for cultural expectation and learned behavior. So I thought that was interesting. It says that, um, you know, even with all this information, women reported that once they even got a diagnosis, it's like, well, where now? There really aren't a lot of resources. And that even, it says this, women felt that due to a lack of specific adult autism services, I don't fit mental health, I don't fit learning disability or disparity, I just fall between the gaps, and that continues to go on and on and on. So we have a long way to go, but I just keep saying that if I had not understood the female phenotype, I don't know that I would have gone down this rabbit hole, and that's why I keep sharing it. It is not to discount that anyone, once again, can have any of these symptoms and traits and experiences, and all of them are valid.